so first of all, let me just once, once again thank all of you for coming. And what's so neat about this particular symposium is that I remember when I was just out in practice, one of the upper family practice residents that I admired, I happened to see her and I had just come back from a conference and I said, you know, I learned a really interesting thing at this conference, but that was about the only thing. She says, oh yeah. She says, there's a lot of times where I don't learn anything. I come back from a conference and if I can just learn one thing, it was, it was a worthwhile conference. Well, hopefully all of you will be learning 10, 15, 20, 25 new things. And this particular talk contains a lot of new things because uh, in the past four months, I just got back from uh, India and what I had to do was a, uh, an IBC Academy by myself. Normally I do it with Dr. Levy and uh, he couldn't make it. And so I did, I did eight 90 minute lectures. So my poor wife felt like she was a IBC Academy widow and she, she was thinking, aha, he got it done, it's over, we're great. And then I said, but no, I've got this uh, symposium coming up and, and I learned so many things. You know, when you really, really focus your attention and dive into a topic, all kinds of things just start popping up. And, uh, and of course, uh, seeing patients, I still see a lot of patients who feel like the IVC is not quite enough and I, we do the nutrient testing and I try to get them to eat a better diet and get the exercise and all the lifestyle things. But I keep thinking there's a missing piece. Well, today I'm going to share with you the, uh, the background, the context of the missing piece. And the good news is the part that I really didn't quite get to, I will get to it at the very end of my talk, but it's going to be just a little snippet of the information. But I finally, a couple of days ago, got Dr. Frank Schallenberger's uh, PowerPoint in the, uh, in the email. How many of you know Dr. Schallenberger? Yeah, he's a dynamic guy. Anyway, he is going to fill in the last piece of my talk because it's exactly where I was going. And I, I have to give him credit for without his leadership and the conference that I went to down in Dallas a couple of years ago, I wouldn't know about this missing piece. But it's a crucial piece of information that's going to give you uh, a new set of tools that you've never thought would probably be this effective. But my sense is this is one of those missing pieces. I'm sure there are more missing pieces, but this one's uh, very important. So, so what I would like to encourage all of you to do on this first slide, there is a web address that I, if you can, at some point, put it into your computer and download this. Uh, it's a 120-page PDF file called The Root Cause and the Dramatic Rise of Chronic Disease. So I renamed my talk after this because in the middle of my talk, I basically show you what's in this particular PDF because it's so powerful. Remember that um, when you probably first read about this symposium, we were, we were uh, dubbing it the symposium to get to the roots of mitochondrial dysfunction. And obvi obviously there are multiple roots that affect the mitochondria. And all of these things that's on this slide, I will be indirectly or indirectly addressing in this presentation. But in the process, I've changed the title of my talk several times. Uh, my wife is still a vitamin C widow. Uh, and so I came up with, and I've been invited to speak up in Minneapolis on uh, vitamin C and cancer, and it's the orthomolecular group, and I've been intimately involved with uh, orthomolecular, and I love the concept of orthomolecular, but I've always thought it's just a little bit short of being as, of what it should be, and so I've kind of created my own name here called Orthos, and uh, Orthos is the uh, repair process that our cells go through once they have been attacked by a pathogen or a toxin or some other uh, factor. And uh, where I came up with this is two years ago when we did the symposium, I focused on dysfunctions. And you'll see in my little uh, dysfunction right here, this Y in, in big red. 
And Dr. Nia Stephanopoulos, who's going to be one of our speakers, it's either tomorrow or the next, I think it's tomorrow. She's got a great talk. But she's, she said what has propelled her through medicine is always asking the question, why? What's the deeper, what's the deeper model, the deeper root cause? And so, in general, what I've felt like I've observed in my practice in the last 31 years at the Reardon Clinic and 42 years in practice is that most of the modern diseases are not things, they're not entities, they are dysfunctional processes within the cell. So orthos is that tendency of the cell to self-correct through a process of repair. And we have self-correcting systems that involve ob obviously redox. Redox is the key thing to remember here. But these system repair processes have become dysfunctional. Now some of the highlights of my talk is I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what orthos is and it's really the opposite of allos. Allopathic medicine is really remedy medicine and we all do practice allopathic medicine whenever we prescribe anything as a single you know, remedy. And so really the truth about healing cancer is that you have to look at cancer as a verb instead of a noun and you have to look at it in, in all of the systems that are dysfunctioning that are bringing about uh, cancer. And so uh, pathos, pathos is, is where I'm gonna get to discussing this dramatic rise of chronic illness in the past 25 years. And I'm gonna show you the numbers and it is astounding. There are 40 major chronic diseases that have risen by about 1,000%. And you say, are you just exaggerating? Is this just a, is this an estimate? It's based upon numbers. We're obviously gonna talk about the mitochondria and I'm gonna pick up where Dr. Levy left off and that is what's going on inside the matrix of the mitochondria because that's an extremely important place because that's where energy is made and unfortunately that's where the rogue electrons can generate those superoxides that trigger a whole bunch of problems including aging and other issues. But there's a new problem that has arisen that has arisen within the context of the cell itself, and that's gonna be really interesting. We're gonna talk about, oh no, oh no, oh, uh, O-N-O-O. -O. This is peroxynitrite, which I'm gonna identify as, I call it the cause, but it is just, let's just say it's a major new player that we don't think about, but yet it's got very good documentation. And what it's doing is it's giving rise to dysfunctional signaling. So we, we still have the problem as so eloquently uh, expressed by Dr. Levy that oxidative stress is the root cause and we tend to think of it being caused by something. But what about just the signaling process itself being out of whack and causing oxidative stress, an intrinsic form of oxidative stress? We're gonna talk about um, radicals and how the ascorbate radical is the most fascinating part about vitamin C. Uh, uh, vitamin C is really, when you start thinking about the ascorb ascorbyl radical, it's a bioxidant and we'll get into that. And it functions in a, a non-rate limited fashion, which is extremely important. And the, the thing that we're gonna talk about at the very end is also can be non-rate limited. Most of your intracellular antioxidants are rate limited and we'll, we'll get into that. And so this gives rise to the possibilities now of continuous infusions or continuous therapy. Dr. Levy uh, or released or unveiled the fact that we now have the possibility of creating continuous IV or oral vitamin C. But we are also very carefully looking at now continuous uh, IV vitamin C via pumps or other methods that people can wear. And so this is, a, we're going back and looking at that research that Linus Pauling did and then that Dr. Reardon followed up on in Nebraska. And so that was what Dr. Uh, Nina was alluding to at the very end of her presentation. So the key idea that Dr. Reardon tried to get across to his patients is that you know we're really not treating cancer here, we treat patients who have cancer. And that's great, and, I, and a lot of people say, is that just semantics? And I don't think it is. He was a very personable guy, and he, you know, it's, it's people who have illnesses. These, these illnesses don't, ex they don't walk around as independent entities. And so it's really important to understand that we're dealing with patients, 
But it's important for us as practitioners to have a good construct in our minds of what we're trying to do with these patients. For instance, if you look at ALOS, the ALOS disease remedy approach, which is what's typically being done, and the remedies are getting more and more expensive and more and more esoteric. Immunotherapy happens to be the big thing, and I think it's got some definite possibilities but it's a, another remedy. We're gonna to try to fix cancer as if it were some kind of thing that we're gonna attack and we're gonna fix it. Uh, so that's remedy to disease, determine the grade and rate of the tumor, kill the cancer cells, but in the process we're gonna create a lot more oxidative set, stress and the only thing we're measuring for our outcome is the quantity of survival. And you can show that there is some improved survival, there is some tumor regression, but the net result overall is not too hot. So then shift into what Dr. Reardon, I believe, was talking about, and I'm just going to call it orthos adjunctive care. Here we're caring for the patient. We're searching for and trying to correct underlying causes or malfunctions, dysfunctions. We're strengthening the healthy cells and we're repairing the oxidative stress and the signaling and thereby improving quality of life as well as quantity of life and hopefully reaching for that cure that could be done for more more patients because right now this disease still continues to be on the rise. We have a lot of uh, giants that we're standing on the shoulders of and I won't get into that but uh, these are orthos oncology pioneers in my opinion. So one of the ways I'm going to kind of create a structure around these ideas is, is this concept of hallmarks of cancer. Uh, these really are plausible me mechanisms, which you could call root causes of cancer. They are a unified theory of causation, but orthos, the orthos version of this is where we take into consideration personal and orthocellular processes that have become dysfunctional that we can address scientifically and with compassion at the same time. So this particular flow diagram is my orthos systems repair process. And I'll be showing it several times. I'm, I'm hoping that you'll all uh, use your, uh, your app in order to review these slides later on because it's really, I'm not just gonna go through it right now, but it, in a sense, the, the lecture is itself this particular flow system in terms of understanding not cancer as a noun, but cancer as a verb, cancering, a non-healing wound. And so the seven hallmarks of cancer, as I mentioned, these are plausible mechanisms that the uh, conventional world of science, have. I, they've used these to uh, basically highlight what's going wrong in the uh, cellular process that's giving rise to uh, dysfunctions. So we're gonna start out with one of these, the first one, the self-sufficiency of growth signals. And I'm gonna create uh, this idea that cancer is a non-healing wound. And uh, doc, Dr. Reardon's son, Neil Reardon, uh, wrote a book, or wrote a nice article on this. I'll show you his picture in just a second. So here's a, a simple diagram of the model of a, red a cellular redox model of what happens in wound healing. So normally we live, hopefully, in a balanced redox state. We're adapted to our environment. And we have some kind of injury, some kind of disruption, or some kind of uh, perturbation, whatever you want to call it, oxidative stress. And that causes injury to the system. It disrupts it. And that disruption actually causes a, a signal. And this signal is oxidative. So this is an example of where oxidation is serving a specific function within the cell. And that triggers a whole series of responses that together we can call inflammation. And if everything's working right and we're healing properly, the redox life process restores us back to this balanced state of adaptation. So this particular book by Dr. Naidu is worth getting. It was uh, at one point, it's a $150 book but uh, it's available, it was available on Amazon for about $30, $39 at one point. It's an amazing book. But it's also about this concept that life really is electron flow. So on a molecular basis, the whole living process is nothing more than an orderly, an 
orderly flow and transfer, transfer of electrons. So when you have dysfunction in the flow, you're gonna generate a whole lot of uh, errant signals that's gonna create problems in and of itself. And that also happens because of external events, but it can also be part of the internal repair process going awry as well. So there's no lack of external oxidative stress factors, and I think Dr. Levy's absolutely right that the, the uh, mouth is totally ignored and, and is an ama uh, I won't call it amazing, I'll just call it a horrible source of hidden uh, infections that can give rise to terrible uh, malfunctions within the body. But there's a lot more than that. I mean, you know, you can look at lifestyle, social, environmental, miscellaneous, there's, and medications, unfortunately, are major, uh, med are major mitochondrial disruptors, but all of these things can uh, give rise, and certainly these, the psychosocial uh, dynamic uh, stress can certainly, and change, uh, and post-traumatic stress syndromes can certainly give rise to problems. So not only do we have oxidative stress, but now we have to add the term nitrosative stress because nitric oxide is a major signaling um, uh, uh, radical within the body. And so oxidative stress, as, as Dr. Levy pointed out, it's electron depletion. The biomolecules are disrupted by electron depletion, but also because of dysfunctional cell signaling. And it's the restoration of the depletion that's important, but you also have to restore the cell signaling in order to get proper redox flow. And so you can see what's happened to my diagram here in terms of we have both external and internal oxidative stress that gives rise to injury, and that creates dysfunctional signaling, which can create the non-healing wound, which sets people up for chronic illness. And so this concept was uh, written up in an article that you can read in Medical Hypothesis, Dr. Neil Reardon, who was the unsung hero of much of the uh, Reardon uh, research. He, uh, he, he, Neil is brilliant, if you ever get a chance to visit with Neil. Anyway, he wrote this article, Cancer as a Functional Repair Tissue. So uh, cancer is the non-healing wound, from, and all of these are chronic injuries that we sustain in the world that we're in, physical injuries, chemical injuries, bio, biological type injuries, and emotional and mind-body injuries. So all of these things are part of the life process. And uh, the concept of hormesis, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. And we're all adapting as best we can, and hopefully we can, we can fix the problems that we have. But with cancer, evidently something gets so much out of whack that it doesn't appear to be fixed. And so it's a failure to repair the sustained cellular in injury, and that creates an out-of-balance redox, persistent disruption, and the signal itself creates oxida excessive oxidation, which results in uncontrolled inflammation, which is the seventh hallmark of cancer cells, and it sets up a state of anaerobic cellular regression, which is the uh, essence of cancer cells. And this is why advanced cancer patients become cachexic and acidotic, and they, they lose their appetite, and they lose their weight, and they eventually succumb by malnutrition to their illness or other more catastrophic events. So this signaling, we, as, as Dr. Nina pointed out in her talk, we, we looked at that in the, uh, the RECNAC uh, research and we were looking at this cytokine array, which looks at cancer growth signals, uh, uh, the so-called oncogenes. But I think that's a misperception of what's actually going on. These are the genes that are attempting to heal the wound. So your angiogenesis, your inflammation, your differentiation, your, even your apoptosis, all these here on, on the, uh, let's see, on the left side, uh, basically are attempts of the cell to heal itself. And what happens, the turn off the healing signals become very minimal and the turn on heal the wound signals become very pronounced. And so we can control those signals with IVC. Vitamin C will attenuate those signals. And uh, Dr. Xiaolong Ming, who was the other author of this, uh, this very important paper, he showed that even one 75 gram IVC can cause a dramatic shift 
in cytokine activity towards normal. See, your cytokines are signaling proteins, signaling molecules that the body uses. And so they looked at 22 cytokine categories and they gave a series of IV vitamin C and they were able to show that vitamin C does attenuate or tone down this uh, excessive signaling uh, process. So if we look at what is a healthy cell, a, a healthy cell has a slightly reducing intracellular milieu. There's obviously oxidation and reduction going on at the same time. But if it becomes overly oxidative, then it shifts in favor of depletion and accelerated aging and the uh, superoxide is made in excessive amounts. You get electron, train, electron chain uh, leakage and that can speed up the aging process. And so, but the, the hallmark of these cells is poor oxygen utilization. And this is why I think Dr. Schallenberger kind of hit upon this, and he's got, written a very important book, which I'll show you in just a second, which basically says that oxygen utilization is the key issue. If you're not using oxygen very well, your cells are hypoxic, it's going to induce this hypoxia induction factor. So the HIF uh, transcription factor is going to be induced in this case, and it creates all kinds of havoc. It's supposed to be an adaptation response, but it creates all kinds of havoc. So we have the redox reserve, which we've defined, and we have redox injury. And that's what many uh, theoretical uh, researchers call ROS, you know, reactive oxygen species. And that's the only way they think of it, is reactive oxygen species, kind of in the negative sense. And it's these sustained ROS that causes the cellular dysfunction. Now, where it's located uh, defines the disease and the organ of location, as Dr. Levy points out in his talks. And if you get multi-organ injury, you're going to have a dysregulation of the entire body. And this is how, uh, how chronic illnesses uh, progress as well. So pervasive redox injury is the root cause of chronic illness. And that's why we're entering into the era of redox medicine, in my opinion. So, the wounded cellular environment is where you have a dominant oxidizing intracellular milieu that the body cannot it, uh, uh, correct itself from. And this comes about because the other side of the oxidative signal is that it's an SOS. It's a, it's a, it's a call for help. It's, it's a call for intracellular inflammatory process or adaptive process to commence. But if that signal becomes too loud or too inappropriate, it's like yelling fire in a crowded theater. It creates havoc. And this is the dysfunction that I'm going to show you is, is occurring all over the place in modern times and is bringing about the ramped up tsunami of chronic illness that we are experiencing in our generation the last 25 years. So we, the question was asked, is all oxidation bad? Well, of course not. There is good cellular ox oxidation, we need it for immunity, we need it for energy metabolism, but the bad cellular oxidation, we know about that, and that sets up chain reactions which can damage cell membranes, mitochondria, and DNA, and these are what give rise to the degenerative chronic illness that we're all so familiar with, and really which makes up probably 85 to 90 to 95 percent of the type of patients that we see in our offices. It's all, it shows up in all the chronic illnesses. So, so this, the bottom is ROS, bad cellular oxidation, but good cellular oxidation could be called the SOS, SOS, I guess. So back to the seven hallmarks of cancer, insensitivity to anti-growth signals, evasion of apoptosis, and the inflammatory microenvironment. I was going to kind of, these are some of the big ones. They are all triggered by cellular hypoxia. And the guy that kind of got a sense for this early on was Dr. Schallenberger with his bioenergy testing. He actually puts people on a bike, measures their oxygen and utilization and CO2 production. And from that, he can tell you whether or not your mitochondria are working properly. He measures this so-called EQ, the energy quotient, and oxygen in, CO2 out. And when that becomes dysregulated, then you're gonna start to see people shifting to a glycolytic state. 
Most of the patients who have trouble with obesity, fatigue, sleep, their cells have shifted glycolytic. They may not be all the way to anaerobic glycolysis, but to me, the definition of type 2 diabetes is basically a person who cannot shift from glycolysis into beta oxidation, which is the more effective way of generating heat. So Dr. Uh, Schallenberger wrote this book on, ox on ozone therapy, you know, and when we give ozone, 95% of it is oxygen. And, and Dr. Scott Shearer is going to be here uh, tomorrow and talking about hyperbaric oxygen and why oxygen is a key factor in uh, helping our patients recover their overall health. And so anyway, uh, Dr. Uh, Schallenberger called this, this tendency of the, of the person to uh, utilize oxygen efficiently, he called it early onset mitochondrial dysfunction. So you can see where the dysfunction comes in. It's at the core energy structure of the cells, the mitochondria, which Dr. Levy did a very nice job of defining how important the mitochondria are, because without energy, there's no electron flow. You've got to have energy for electron flow. And when we start looking at the so-called reactive oxygen species, this is that same pyramid, but I'm kind of, I've portrayed it as upside down because it's going to pull you down. These dysfunctions are going to create chronic illness. And they're also going to trigger this HIF1 alpha, the, the uh, hypoxia induction factor. And so this is a major player in the uh, regression of the cell, because one way to think of a cancer cell, it's a healthy cell attempting to overcome a chronic wound, and it's regressed back to a more primitive style of function. The eukaryotic function of the cell has shifted back to prokaryotic in an attempt to survive in a hostile, inflamed, uh, microcellular environment, which we now know is one of the hallmarks of cancer. So this hypoxia induction factor is activated by low O2 and low ascorbate. Did you know that, Tom? Low, low ascorbate will also activate the HIF factor. And so, uh, so we have mitochondrial uh, oxidative stress, which gives rise to inadequate oxidation. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a paradox. How could an excess oxidation give rise to inadequate oxidation of NADH to NAD? Which, if, you, if you've been to any of Dr. Schallenberger's talks, that ratio of NAD to NADH is crucial. Anyway, that results in decreasing ATP as the Krebs cycle slows down. Then without ATP, you cannot regenerate your intracellular enzymes, such as glutathione reductase, peroxidase, the desmutases, the catalases. You cannot, that's why cancer cells, can, they don't have very much catalase. They can't, they don't have much ATP. They're struggling to make ATP. And this increases mitochondrial injury, and now you find yourself in the vicious cycle of cellular hypoxia, and the cell just gradually shifts anaerobic. And this can happen over a, a, a time period of years. And so you, all along, you're in, inducing more and more of this transcription factor, HIF. Now, What's really interesting about this slide, could this be, you know, I've had so many patients ask me, why in the heck did nature decide to disable the GLOW enzyme? Huh? Have, have, how many of you have been asked that question by your patients? Why did we mute, what was the survival value of not having the GLOW enzyme functional? Well, here it is. Could, could vitamin C itself, the level of vitamin C in the cell and in the mitochondria be a signaling system. Is this why GLOW mutated? So the advantage of a lack of vitamin C synthesis allowed the human body to better respond to its current nutritional status. When you're low on vitamin C, your nutritional status is bad. This information regulates the proper expression of hypoxia induction factor. So we could say that low ascorbate serves as a stress titration system. So it's a system itself. Now, I'm not going to go into this. I, put, I, I took a picture from my, from my notebook. But Dr., uh, if you go back to Dr. Uh, Nina's slides, she has this in a much better form. 
And so, and I also put this in your slides, this is a more uh, well, better developed idea of why vitamin C may actually be a signaling system for the HIF uh, transcription factor. So this brings us to the concept of internal oxidative stress. Internal oxidative stress. I mean, as if external oxidative stress wasn't bad enough, our bodies, our cells have to put up with internal oxidative stress. And so you can see there all the injuries that can happen to the mitochondria. You know, the mitochondria has got all this membrane, it's got DNA, and these are very susceptible to the superoxide and the hydroxyl radical and all the other free radicals that I'm gonna talk about. These all cause damage to the mitochondria. Thank God they do replicate themselves every five to 12 days. But unfortunately, we have sick mitochondria that are helping us limp along. And your patients who are chronically fatigued and can't sleep and their muscles ache, they've got dysfunctional mitochondria. Your cancer patients have got dysfunctional mitochondria. That's the bottom line. And so this is persistent oxidative stress, all right, but it's increasing inflammation. It's increasing hypoxia. The cells are shifting into anaerobic glycolysis and acidosis. The acidosis causes muscle pain. You have increasing mitochondrial injury and damage, which is causing the production of the superoxide in excessive amounts. And I'm going to tell you why that's bad. And that res results in damage to the P53 gene. And that shuts off the ability of the cell to apoptose. Now, it can still necrose. But that's bad because necros necrosis basically sends out even more inflammatory signals. So we would rather the damaged cells apoptose, but they've run out of injury. They're hypoxic. So this is right at the core of what's going on, and this is why Warburg came up with his amazing observation that cancer is basically anaerobic fermentation. It's a cell that has regressed back to a very primitive style of functioning, and it's generating all kinds of lactic acid and it's burning up the body's reserves very quickly because it can only generate two ATPs per molecule of glucose, whereas if you use beta oxidation, you can get 26. And so he, deserve, he demonstrated that cancer cells have become anaerobic obligates. They're trying to survive. And they are creating this uh, environment of, um, this micro environment of inflammation and cellular hypoxia. The cells are wounded and they're trying to survive. But their first instinct when they get into this state is to proliferate. Uh, this is the effect of, of oxidation on a population of cancer cells. If you make the cells more, increase the oxidative stress, they'll try to increase their cell division to the point that they soon start to have apoptosis. So this increasing oxidative uh, stress drives this signal of increase the number of cells. So, it's, so cancer is a proliferative phenomenon for this, for this particular reason. It's trying to heal, it's trying to survive, but it's not making it. So here's, again, a little bit bigger uh, depiction of my model of the chronically ill patient. And I showed it to you before. They've got internal and external oxidative stress, chronic sustained injury, they've got damage to their DNA, their membrane structures are damaged, their cellular respiration is now shifting anaerobic. They've got all this dysfunctional signaling occurred. They've got the HIF. They've got all kinds of cytokines firing at this point, trying to help them survive. They're generating excessive oxygen species, especially the superoxide radical, and they're basically stuck in this state of pathos, repair process dysfunction. And so the, at the bottom of this, all of these various uh, molecules they do the same thing. They generate more of the superoxide radical. And interestingly enough, it's the superoxide radical that, that causes uh, ascorbate to shift to the ascorbate radical. And I'm going to come back to that in just a few minutes here. But also what happens when you combine the superoxide radical with the, the nitric oxide radical, you get this, this peroxynitrate, nitrite, which is O-N-O-O minus. And that is a major new problem that we're seeing more and more of. So just a quick brief discussion about the as ascorbyl radical because uh, Tom and I have talked about how amazing this is. It is relatively non-reactive. It's once the ascorbate has donated one electron, it, uh, it forms this kind of interesting uh, radical 
which is a non-harmful radical. It's kind of there waiting to do what it needs to do. It either can accept an electron from somewhere or it can donate an electron. So it's a reducing agent and it, and it doesn't make more superoxide. So it's not causing more trouble. It's there to help. And so, uh, so this is kind of, I'm not gonna go into this, but this is how the ascorbyl radical is formed in solution. And this is kind of looking at all the family of ascorbates, which most of us don't think about, but it's Gary Butner from the University of Iowa does a beautiful job of depicting this in his research. But down there, I've, I've put the golden uh, triangle around the ascorbyl radical. And so all the way back in 1976, in Dr. Stone's book, The Healing Factor, he defined redox. He basically said, hey, this is an oxidation reduction system. But what he was really talking about is that although ascorbic acid is like glucose, unlike glucose, it contains an unusual, highly reactive combination of molecules called an indiol group, or he called it a pi system. The presence, the presence of this group confers upon ascorbic acid molecule certain unique biochemical characteristics which may explain its vital importance in the living process. He went so far as to say that life on this, on Earth, on the, on the terrain, probably could not have survived without, the, uh, uh, without ascorbate. So again, I'm, I'm Dr. Levy and his moments of lucidity, which do happen fairly often, uh, he defined this ascorbyl radical as a redox buffer molecule. It's brilliant because that's what it does. It can, it can serve to give an electron or it can take an electron and it tends to smooth out things. I always tell the story that I one day bought a new mower and forgot to put oil in it. And I only got about halfway across the lawn before the, the engine stalled. Fortunately, I put the oil in and it was okay. It didn't injure it beyond repair. But without redox buffering, uh, our cells would be in big, big trouble. And it's when we lose redox buffering that, that vitamin C and other uh, redox molecules start signaling, help, help, SOS, SOS. And if we don't get the help, then it starts shifting to ROS, re uh, reactive oxygen species. So a major source of these uh, SOS uh, is the uh, superoxide which is due to electron leakage down the, uh, the chain. And that happens inside the matrix of the mitochondria. We won't go into all of that, but that's where most of your superoxide is produced. And so, uh, and, and, and this ascorbate radical is very good at regenerating the glutathione reductase, which is a very important antioxidant. There's a problem though. It's, it's a critical molecule for resisting oxidative stress and maintaining a reactive environment within the cell. But the problem is, in order to make glutathione, in order to catalyze, that's, that's that, it's an amazing enzyme. GSR is an amazing, complicated enzyme. But for that enzyme to work, it needs selenium, magnesium, zinc, vitamin C, B1, B2, B6, which we should be testing and we want to give our patients. But that these are rate limiting factors that keep the glutathione from being its optimal self. And so without having these factors, it just allows these free radicals to, to grow and that causes the uh, further dysfunction of the cell. Enter the electron buffer, ascorbyl, the ascorbyl radical, and it is a non-rate limited antioxidant free radical scavenger. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cathcart. Robert Cathcart came up with this concept of non-rate limited. As long as you're putting adequate amounts of vitamin C in, it can act as a, an electron buffer. If you run out of vitamin C, well, that's, that's its, it's, its own rate limiting factor. It's the only factor. And what I'm going to reveal to you at the end of the lecture, there's another non-rate limited molecule that the body makes that we have overlooked as being a kind of partner to vitamin C that we need to bring into the equation in order to get better results with our patients. So, so if we deplete vitamin C, back to my orthos hallmark model, uh, vitamin C depletion basically results in excessive oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction, as well as all kinds of other things that happen in the cytoplasm, that happen outside the cell membrane. I mean, vitamin C takes care of all the external 
oxidative stress factors, whereas we need something maybe for the internal matrix uh, mitochondria, and that's what we're going to talk about. So this slide, which I'm going to do right now, I'm doing pretty good with my time. I hope you guys are holding on to your seats. Uh, this is the most important slide of my presentation, and it starts with the point that I began reading uh, Dr. Levy's book on, on ozone, which is a pretty tough book to read. I think I've tried to read it about five times, and it's, it's challenging. But the key point that Dr. Levy points out is that uh, if you have an inadequate ratio of NADH to NAD, that is the beginning of your problems because you need that in order to generate adequate amounts of ATP. And so without adequate ATP, the cellular energy level goes down and without energy, the motor starts to dysfunction and everything else starts to go into chaos. So this is the, uh, what did I say? Oh, Schallenberger says this. I've been around Tom too, way too long. <clears throat> well, I enjoy the credit. Thank you, okay, thank you. So anyway, a lower ratio really simply means poor electron flow, poor electron transport. And as a result, you get your decreasing ATP. You only make two ATPs per molecule of glucose instead of the additional 36. That reduces your production of the antioxidant enzymes because glutathione reductase is rate limited. That uh, allows electron leakage to go un unresolved unreduced, and you get increasing mitochondrial DNA and membrane injury, which results in mitochondrial oxidative stress, which causes P53 dysfunction, which disables apoptosis. And so the cell over time drifts anaerobic. And here's something that a lot of people don't think about. When you're in anaerobic metabolism, your cells are making less carbon dioxide. And so that decrease in CO2 output, you can't displace the oxygen from your hemoglobin. That's how this, the hemoglobin releases the oxygen to your cells, is that it depends upon the CO2 to take the place of the oxygen, and then the oxygen is released to the cells. This is one of the reasons why cancer cells become so hypoxic, and now we have that HIF uh, coming stronger and stronger. So you have faulty oxygen support and the transcription factor, or HIF, worsens the hypoxia. So now you have cellular hypoxia, the vicious cycle, and this is what I showed you before. But now let's think one more step. And so this is what I call, and so this is progressive oxidative stress. This falls within the definition that Dr. Levy has defined. But what happened to this ratio of reactive oxygen species to the SOS signals? Why did that get out of whack, and what can we do about it? And so I'm going to say this is where we lack an acute signal. I'm going to digress for just a minute. In the last couple of years, we've been doing prolozone injections at our clinic. And I've always still been fascinated, why does an, a clear-cut oxidant like ozone help so many things? Why does ozone help with cancer patients? Why do the hydroxyl radicals that the, that the vitamin C creates, why is that beneficial? Well, because it's an acute signal. It's a hormetic kickstart to get the dysfunctional cell back working again. Now, you, that's not the only thing you need, but I think it's an, an important part, and that's why I do believe that the IVC, high-dose IV vitamin C can act as a kind of a kickstart to get the cell out of this chronic hypoxic inflamed state. So this is what I call the oxidative paradox. So, and, and I think this is why ozone therapy works as well as it does. It's a purely oxidative thing, but it's, it's taking these cells that are wounded and can't heal and getting them back into action again. So Dr. Reardon found this, and this was all in uh, Nina's uh, report, that IVC does restore apoptosis. And so, uh, and I just wanted to end with this idea that that the uh, ascorbyl radical is a bioxidant molecule. It, in high doses, it acts biologically uh, as, a, as an antioxidant. It can mop up free radicals. It modulates cytokine-controlled con inflammation, and it promotes the formation of healthy collagen that can wall off the tumor. These are all things that are beneficial. But at the same time, at the pharmacologic doses, 
It's a pro-oxidant that generates what? Hydroxyl radicals, the most powerful radical in the human body. Why is that good? Well, healthy cells will uh, neutralize that with adequate uh, catalase, and cancer cells can't. And so maybe it's doing something beneficial. Matter of fact, it is doing something beneficial because we know that vitamin C can generate some degree of apoptosis at least. Now here's the second most important slide in my presentation that only came to me just about a week ago. Dr. Levy reported that the external membrane, the outer membrane of the mitochondria, which is the same type of membrane as the cell membrane, it has SVCT vitamin C transporters. And then the, the inner membrane the, that, that allows uh, vitamin C to get into the matrix of the, of, the, of the mitochondria, it relies on a transporter that is very similar to uh, the SVCT. However, now at the very bottom of this slide in fine print, which you cannot see, but right now I'm gonna blow it up. Let's look at the fine print. What that says is that the mitochondrial transformer, transporter of ascorbate functions with high affinity in the presence of low millimolar concentrations of sodium and, here you go, Tom, in the absence of calcium. But what have we just said? What did Dr. Levy just say? That calcium is a cellular toxin. And so if you start building up high amounts of calcium in your cells, this transporter may not work very well. And you may need a lot more magnesium to try to help rectify the situation and vitamin K. So, and, and, other fa and get the calcium, excess calcium out of your diet. But anyway, this is, I think, a key thing. And, and it didn't really make sense to me until about two months ago when I was at the, uh, maybe that was longer, June, July, August, about three or four months ago when I was at the SOPMED conference in Colorado Springs and heard Dr. Mercola speaking on this topic, he, he quoted a paper where he, the paper states with evidence that there has been an incredible growth of chronic illness in the last 25 years, in the last generation, that 40 plus chronic disorders have more than doubled in the past 1990 to 2015. And many of these were not around that much before the 1980s. So when we look at that, and this is based upon good data, look at these numbers. Fibromyalgia, there's been a 7,727% increase since 1990. And there's, all these other ones are hypothyroidism, 700% increase. Um, Look over here at bipolar disease of youth. That's a 10,800. I think, I think some of that is our friends, the psychiatrists, or I think they're over-diagnosing that. And we'll actually, Dr. Ann Zotter and I will be discussing that uh, on Saturday morning. Chronic fatigue syndrome, 11,000. And as we go through, I'll show you that sleep, every patient that I see about, maybe, maybe every now and then one or two will say they're sleeping pretty good, but most everyone say, hey, I'm having trouble sleeping. What's going on? So this paper calls these diseases of civilization, and I'm going to state that I don't totally agree with the paper because it says that none of them are associated with an identifiable pathogen. The key word there is identifiable. They're not looking at the mouth, and I firmly agree with Dr. Levy that we've got to take better care of our oral health. But also I'm going to bring into uh, the discussion the whole notion of fungal diseases, and I hope all of you get to visit uh, Dr. Fry's uh, uh, booth back there because that was a big wake-up call for me that I'm going to talk about in just a minute because their system of tissue diagnosis and blood and urine diagnosis, they can identify fungi which are not identified by typical uh, culture. So anyway, so these, uh, this, is, this is a major growth. And so the paper that this comes from is by Patcher, uh, Pal Patcher, Nitric Oxide and Peroxynitrite in Health and Disease. It was published all the way back in 2007. How many of you heard of it? I hadn't heard of it. And so this paper details the massive destructive capabilities of peroxynitrite. So what, he, what he's done, this is a very reputable researcher. I'll let you kind of look at that later. Basically what he's saying is that uh, this 
nitric oxide, an endothelial-derived relaxing factor, has emerged as a fundamental signaling device regulating ver virtually every critical cellular function, as well as a potent mediator of cellular damage in a wide range of conditions. Recent evidence indicates that most of the cytotoxicity is not attributed to NO, but to peroxynitrite, which is produced from a reaction between nitric oxide and superoxide and nitric oxide and the superoxide radical. They're both radicals, but when they get together, they form this peroxynitrite, which triggers cellular responses, subtle modulations of cell signaling, and overwhelming oxidative injury, committing cells to necrosis or apoptosis. So it's a crucial pathogenic mechanism in all of these different things, 60 plus Chronic diseases have been shown to be connected to peroxynitrite. You can look at this a little bit later. You know what you, but you know what I'm talking about. It also disrupts 97 critical biological processes, which are documented in this particular paper. He calls it the smoking gun of chronic disease. So when you combine nitric oxide and the superoxide, superoxide is really not that bad of a free radical. It's also a signaling molecule. But when you combine these two signalers in a dysfunctional way, you get the peroxynitrite, which creates high levels of oxidative stress, nitrative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction, and cytokine storm, which causes more and more inflammation. So this is a, uh, a depiction of this particular reaction and how the oh no, Oh, no, oh, uh, creates so much damage. So this was, uh, this was, I don't know if we would call this guy the discoverer, but Martin Paul uh, gave a lecture out in San Francisco that I attended about 10 years ago, and it just totally went over my head. He basically was talking about how this created a, a very vicious cycle. And you can see that I'm not going to go into the cycle, but you can see how it's generating all these inflammation factors. Now. I'm reading all this, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and I've heard Dr. Levy say 20, 30 times that calcium is a very severe intracellular toxic factor. And the way that Powell, Martin Powell, discovered this cycle is that he, he analyzed 24 in vitro and animal studies on calcium channel blockers. Dr. Levy will tell you that calcium channel blockers, if used in small doses, will reduce your all-cause five-year mortality. They're the one medication that probably is one of the best medicines you could use, as long as you don't use too much of it, otherwise you're gonna get edema. But it appears that these drugs actually attenuate oxidative damage, and they're not antioxidants. All they do is prevent the excessive uptake of calcium within the cell which is lethal, as Dr. Levy says. And you can get this book free from his uh, website or from his address. So anyway, here's the schematic that, if, that uh, if you have this calcium influx, it's what triggers the superoxide and the nitric oxide, which results in the, o, the uh, peroxynitrite formation. And the, the reason it happens is that the, uh, these, uh, these VG... CCs. These are voltage-gated calcium channels. These are activated by a number of factors in our environment. And so when we have oxidative stress, we have more of the superoxide being formed. So here's a big depiction of the voltage-gated calcium channels, VGCCs. And one of the things that was brought up in Colorado is that the idea that cell phones are safe is only true based upon information of about 30 to 40 years ago where they showed that there was no thermal damage from the microwaves that cell phones emit. What they failed to look at is that these activate the VGCC sensors and increase their uptake of calcium into the cells. So it turns out that the invisible cell phone usage that we see may be the cigarette of our times and that there may be a very long uh, incubation period before uh, these 
these microwaves start to bring about a greater and greater in increase of chronic illness. So, so what, what uh, Paul pointed out is that if you, if you attenuate the uh, uptake of, of calcium in the cells, you stop this vicious cycle of the, uh, of the nitric oxide bonding with the superoxide to create the peroxynitrate. So this is uh, another factor. And notice also that when you have this damage, it, uh, it in, whenever you have DNA or cell membrane damage, especially DNA damage, it triggers PARP, which is uh, poly ADP ribose polymerase, which is the polymer that repairs DNA, which is great, but it uses up your, a your NAD. When you use up NAD, you cannot make as much ATP. And so when you can't make as much ATP, that's also setting you on the course for cellular hypoxia. So this chronic disease state appears to be showing up now as a whole plethora of chronic illnesses for which if you ask the doctor, what caused my chronic illness doctor? Well, I don't know, you know, bad genes or bad environment or bad luck. And so anyway, the, there are a number of, these are the same five factors that I've already mentioned but all of these biochemical disruptions are made worse by external oxidative stressors as well. So it's not just the internal oxidative stress, it's the external oxidative stress just bombarding us. And so it's really hard for our cells to generate enough energy to heal this. And so this is where non-rate limited use of ascorbate and X that I'm gonna tell you about in just a second is really important. So this is what I mentioned, the, the dramatic increase, and this has all happened in one generation. Now, I went ahead and showed the actual data from this paper, so obviously you can't read all that, uh, but I, this, the area that's in red, I went ahead and pulled it out as breakout data. And, if, and you can see the different categories. They, they're in those five or six categories, neurologic, inflammatory, uh, mental health, uh, Autoimmune, autoimmune is really on the rise, and certainly the, 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 the gut biome is a big problem. All of us would acknowledge that the disruption of the gut biome is a big part of autoimmune disease. What about the intracellular biome? Our mitochondria, you know, that's how the mitochondria were formed. It was bacteria that was taken into the, the bigger cell, and because it was photosynthetic, it was generating energy for that cell, and so it, it formed a symbiotic relationship. So when we take antibiotics, or when antibiotics are indiscriminately used, we're disrupting the intracellular biome as well. So here's, I've got a couple slides of this, just to show you these numbers are humongous. Uh, the conditions are the very condi very, various things that I see every day, and that I've seen for the last 31 years, and it just seems like people just keep coming in. There's no lack of chronic illness in our society. And, and I really, when I say, when I, I use the term now for the last three or four years that we have a tsunami of chronic illness, it's really true. And so uh, looking at cr cr chronic fatigue syndrome, 11,000% growth rate. So here's some more. Hypertension, kidney stones. I mean, a lot of these are just familiar things and obviously they do have a medical causation that we can address. But if you want to go to the deep, deeper root cause, it is oxidative stress, but it's external and internal oxidative stress causing signal disruption. So he went ahead and added up all the diseases and, you know, that they, they have data for, and there's a 1,142% increase in chronic illness in Western civilization. So he calls this generation growth. Uh, some people would like to say, well, we have better diagnosis, but that, that doesn't explain it. We have people that are getting older. That's not enough to explain it. There's something else causing all of this, and it's because it's an accelerated upward trend that cannot simply be explained by an aging population. And they've got in this paper that if you get a chance to read it, they explain where they get their data and how they, uh, how they developed it. The social impacts of this are unfathomable. I mean, I really, really think we are heading for a, a kind of meltdown in the healthcare system in Western civilization, because you look around the world, 
all of these things are just exploding and doctors are overwhelmed and they're still using the uh, acute care model. You know, antibiotics are still being prescribed, I think overprescribed, and symptom relief remedies are being used. Our, our care for cancer is basically a symptom relief remedy. The symptom is fast growth. And so they're, yeah, they're poisoning the fast growth, but that's not really dealing with the true dysfunction of the illness. So this is all, I think, greatly underestimated. Um, but here's the model again. So it's a dysfunction of this wound healing model, and it's, it's the, the signaling oxygen species are creating more problems than they're solving. So we're having all these reactive oxygen species showing up, and this is the model of poor oxygen utilization, and it involves thyroid and deficient nutrients, and uh, hormones are out of whack, and people are inflamed, and so those are all things that we need to keep dealing with. But if we want to move past the allopathic model, we have to look deeper. We have to treat the deeper causes of these things. And this, is, this takes time. You know, patient care is not an easy process because patients are used to the allopathic remedy approach. They come in expecting us to write out which supplement is they need to take to solve their problems. It's not going to be one supplement. It's not going to be one IV. It's not going to be anything simple. It's going to have to be helping them to become co-learners and to take responsibility for their own health and become part of this revision process that we're having to go through in order to promote better healing in, in the face of all of these environmental factors. So to me, this is orthos. This is getting people interested in healing as a repair process as opposed to single remedy treatments. And so part of that, in order to balance out SOS with the increasing reactive oxygen species, we have to help people make wise choices and become good co-learners, better self-care, uh, and letting people know that this is a process of healing, not a quick fix. And I went ahead and I, I think uh, Mercola on his website, he's got these slides that show 30 different things that you can do to help your patients begin this process. And that's the hard part of our job. People come to us because we're doctors and they expect us to write out a prescription. The IV vitamin C was looked upon as a kind of quick fix and it's not gonna work that way. Uh, I can tell you, 31 years of working with IV vitamin C, it's tremendous. It does all the good things that we've heard about this morning, but it by itself is not the answer. We have to get people thinking more broadly. So, this, uh, so using your cell phones more wisely, all these kids that are on cell phones and it's having an effect. Uh, for those of you that are doubters about it, you know, most of it has to do with the, it's the same thing as the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry makes everything look just rosy with pharmaceuticals. Uh, but most of those studies are done by the pharmaceutical industry. The studies that have looked at the effect of, of EMFs uh, and listed them as harmful, those are industry studies. The non-industry studies shows a much higher level of uh, harmful effect. So the problem is they're, 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 they're not easy answers, but there are answers. It doesn't mean you have to give up your cell phone. It just has, it's just like anything. It's like you don't want to give up eating, but you do want to modify your eating behaviors in a direction that makes you less susceptible to the problems. So these are all things from, uh, from uh, his, his website you can get to uh, pretty easily. So what I did, and this is what this is actually I'm, to the slide that I had started out with when I first was going to do this, this uh, presentation, I was going to look at the eight cancer hallmarks. You know, the seven and eight is actually, they're, they're, they are the breakouts of the microcellular environment, altered cellular energetics and immune evasion. But then I looked at several things, and you can see uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, you can see the ortho-oncology hallmarks that I've been showing you. I'm going to talk just a minute here about a little bit about fungal infections because I think they have been overlooked as a major factor. And uh, then I'm going to show you that the two major treatments that we could use that are orthomolecular is IV vitamin C with an emphasis now on not just the bolus twice a week like we normally do in the Reardon protocol, but looking uh, towards the use of continuous IV vitamin C, because if, if the problem is 
because we, we need something that's non-rate limited, we, we want to keep it going. We want to get it to an uh, adequate dose and keep it going. So we want to, we want to look at oral non-rate limited uh, vitamin C. We want to look at IV non-rate limited vitamin C. Then the other big story is in the field of melatonin. And this is what Dr. Dr. Schallenberger is going to devote his entire lecture to on Saturday. And where I got into that, once again, it was Dr. Schallenberger uh, did a conference that I spoke at. Uh, and at that conference was Dr. Russell Ryder. I encourage all of you that have any interest at all in mitochondria and how melatonin affects it, just type in Russell J. Ryder and mitochondria, and you'll get a wealth of studies that this guy has been pumping out for the last 30 years. It's tremendous. He's at the University of Texas in San Antonio. I won't be able to go into it today, but I want to just take a few minutes. I've got nine minutes left. I want to just talk a little bit about fungal infection. Now, the reason I want to talk about that is at this same at this same uh, SOPMED conference in Colorado Springs, you know how you sit down at lunch with someone you don't know and you don't know what's going to happen and, you, you know, who's this person? And Anyway, Stephen Fry was sitting at the table and we got to talking. I said, what do you do? Well, I'm a family physician, but about 10 years ago, I got frustrated with the fact that I had so many chronic fatigues, so many fibromyalgia, so many Lyme disease patients, so many cancer patients, chronic illness patients. And I was trying to do stuff, but I just felt like we were missing the boat. We weren't really identifying the root causes. So his idea was to start a laboratory because now we can sequence any sample. We can take any urine, blood, or biopsy sample and sequence, do the DNA sequencing, feed it into the computer, and the computer will look at it and identify what organisms and how much of those organisms are present in that sample. Well, in addition to all the various types of samples that he's been looking at, he had a friend who was a urologist who volunteered to give him samples of 15 different um, prostatectomies that this, this urologist had done. So Stephen got these small snap samples and he subjected them to the DNA analysis. And what he found is that the predominant DNA strands that were in that sample was fungal. That it looked like, hmm, prostate, fungal infection? No, can't be, too simple. How could we overlook that? Well, first of all, how many of you really remember much about fungal diseases in medical school? It's kind of glossed over. Yeah, they're out there. Yeah, you get some athlete's foot and some toenail fungus and yeah, a little thrush here and there. You know, yeah, there was a lot of talk about yeast overgrowth, but you know, it's not the real problems. The real problems are the uh, viral and the, uh, and, and, you know, the bacterial infections. But fungal infections are a problem. And so I, I, I list that under my orthos hallmark chronic conditions because fungal infections can mutate DNA. And so uh, this, I put, this slide is out of order, but I wanted to show you that DNA in fungal cells is 98% similar to DNA in human cells. Fungus is eukaryotic. Uh, I did a lecture actually in 2003, I believe it was, the fungal link to cancer. And I totally forgot what I had said in that lecture. And so I went back and looked at it. And sure enough, you start looking, you know, what is fungus? Some people think it's a, a, a plant. And some people think it's more of an animal. But these, these species do cause diseases. It has characteristics of both. It has a nucleus. It breathes oxygen in the animal form. It's anaerobic in the mycelial form. But in the plant form, it breathes without oxygen. It's anaerobic, hmm, in the yeast form. It's a facultative anaerobe. So some of the features are that it's a plant without chlorophyll, no photosynthesis. Fungi don't like sunlight. They like the dark places. That's why you put your moist bread under the sink where it's dark, and then you get your mold growing pretty soon. How do they derive energy? Well, they, they, die, they, they feed off of preformed organic matter. They're saprophytes. They eat dead stuff. 
dead and decaying vegetation. So uh, mushrooms and moles live off dead things. So they're very active when that stuff has lost its life force. So parasites live and reproduced in host cells or animals, often to the detriment of hosts. Well, you could call uh, advancing uh, fungal infections a type of parasitic infun infection. They, they produce an incredible number of spores. There are fungal spores everywhere, everywhere. And they survive very well. There are like 69,000 identified species of, fungal, of fungus, 200 of which are known to cause disease, but mycologists estimate there are 1.5 million species that have yet to be identified, which means there could be 17,000 disease-causing fungal species out there that we don't know about. So Leo Kripe said, we do not live in a world of fungus, but whether, rather we live in the fungus world. And so these uh, Ascomycetes is the largest group of fungi, and they're the ones that form the spores. And these spores, when they get into cells, can disrupt the normal diploid chromosomal pattern within, within human cells, especially if they become active. And may, maybe many of you don't know, but almost all cancer cells, uh, when you look at their chromosomal patterns, they're aneuploidic. They do not have the typical 23 chromosomes. They're all over the place with their chromosomes. And that led this guy back in 1914 to make the chromosomal imbalance theory of cancer, which he was, he was ignored, of course. And so the other thing about uh, fungi is that they, they digest outside of themselves. So what they do is they transport out exozymes and these digest the molecules outside of themselves, and then that's then they, they, they uh, absorb those digested molecules. Well, what are those things that they, they those, those enzymes? Those are mycotoxins. They're basically making mycotoxins, and they can act to break down hyaluronidase. Well, isn't that one of the features of vitamin C, that it strengthens hyaluronidase? Isn't that a feature of cancer, that it breaks down hyaluronidase, and that's how it metastasizes? So the mycotoxins, they're a kind of external immune system. And the way the fungi do it is that they basically send out toxins so that no one wants to come near them. And so these things tend to have all kinds of detrimental effects. They uh, produce toxic results in, in organisms. We're seeing a rise in mold illnesses. A lot of our chronically ill patients, the thing I'm asking about is what kind of an environment do you live in? Has there ever been a flood? Do you have any leaky bathroom fixtures or stuff like that? But unlike bacterial toxins, fungal toxins are not proteins and they're usually not detectable by the immune system of humans and animals. Uh, so if you don't see the fungus, that doesn't mean there isn't mycotoxins there. The good thing is you can now start to measure mycotoxins in the urine. You can send them into Great Plains in different labs and measure them. But they do disrupt cell structures. They do disrupt protein, DNA, and RNA synthesis. They are heat stable, and they generally are not destroyed by canning or processes. Now, I didn't make a slide for this, but there's been a number of researchers over the years that have tried to say that there are the, uh, the cell wall deficient organisms that are in just about every cell. These may be the spores. And the reason we never find them or you never hear about them in medical school is that when you heat the specimen, it destroys, it, it destroys the ability to see it. You, it does not take up the stain. So these, uh, these uh, mycotoxins are doing a lot of damage, uh, they, but they, they can adapt and survive in the intracellular environment. And then when the environment of the, of the intracellular environment becomes uh, friendly to the spore, the seed, it sprouts and you can then begin to get changes that would represent uh, car carcinogenic uh, features. So I already did this slide. So they are facultative anaerobes, as we mentioned. They occur in the cytoplasm. Well, they, it's interesting, fungi, uh, the ones that are aerobic, they're less adaptive. The ones that are anaerobic are more adaptive, which is interesting as to why it, it becomes, uh, when, the, when the cell shifts anaerobic, it may be the effort of the cell to survive in a less 
a friendly environment, a more hostile environment. So cancer cells are anaerobic and fermentative. So the, there are fungal hallmarks that match up with cancer hallmarks. Can I say that this is the cause of cancer? Heck no, but it's a very interesting to th thing to think about as you're planning what to do. And I, and I certainly have gotten more interested in herbal antifungal agents such as olive leaf extract and uh, black seed extract. Some of these things can be very helpful with your cancer patients. So I'm, I'm really at the end of my lecture. I've got 11 seconds left. This basically says that um, melatonin may be the intramatrix molecule that could be of great help to us in uh, in solving the dilemma that we have with our cancer patients. One last slide, and I always show this to patients, that as we age, our ability to make melatonin gr greatly decreases. And isn't it interesting that all the chronic illnesses and aging processes get worse as we get older. Whereas kids, kids can still get sick, but they have a lot more melatonin to work with. And so uh, let's, let us not forget also that stress, what it does, what does stress do to a lot of people? It disrupts their sleep, and then they don't make as much melatonin. So this was my presentation, Allo, orthos, allos, and pathos, uh, the dramatic rise of chronic illness, the idea that mel melatonin might be a key molecule for healing intramatrix oxidative stress, the uh, perox per peroxynitride as a, as a pervasive intracellular cause, a signaling dysfunction cause, and then how that signaling uh, dysfunction occurs because of these gated channels letting in too much calcium. The idea of neutralizing free radicals with non-rate limited uh, processes like IV vitamin C. And the thing about melatonin, what uh, Dr. Schallenberger is going to talk about is that we have greatly misunderstood dosing with melatonin because most people, when they try to take too much melatonin at night, it disrupts their sleep. It's because melatonin, uh, it, vitamin C, just I'll give you one little hint of what Dr. Schallenberger is going to talk about and that Dr. Ryder talks about all the time. Vitamin C can donate two electrons, one vitamin C molecule, so it can neutralize uh, free radical stress. One melatonin molecule can donate, it doesn't, it's not that it donates 10 molecules, but it it donates a molecule and reduces a free radical, and then it changes to a different shape and now can donate more. It can basically, for every one molecule of melatonin, you can neutralize 10 free radical molecules in the matrix. So it's a very powerful antioxidant that is present and that evolved with the mitochondria. So we think that continuous dosing, either IVC or oral vitamin C, and higher dosing of melatonin may be two very powerful tools that I think will be of great help to us in the future. Thank you very much.